morning, good afternoon, and a good evening, depending on where you're joining this webinar. I see a lot of people joining the webinar. I know some of you are joining from Europe. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and director of the Center for International Business Education, often called CYBE or CYBER. Welcome to LMU CYBER special lecture series in international business. This program is funded by the grants awarded by the U.S. Department of Education. LMU is one of the 15 universities in the country that has received this prestigious grants. The cyber serves as regional as well as national resources for students, faculty, and business community through international business education, foreign language training, and research capacities. One of the cyber missions is to provide instruction in critical foreign languages needed to provide an understanding of the cultures and customs of the U.S. trading partners to help improve global competitiveness of the U.S. businesses. When we talk about languages in international business and management education, we often focus on language proficiency. I'm sure that some of you have learned multiple languages because you fall in love with a particular foreign country or to work with a foreign client. Indeed, acquiring foreign language proficiency is critical in increasing competitiveness of the U.S. businesses in the global market. According to a report from the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages, nine out of 10 U.S. employers report a reliance on a U.S.-based employees with language skills other than English and nearly one in four employers acknowledge losing a business opportunity due to deficiency in foreign language skills. However, there is another important language domain which has not received much attention so far. We are very happy to organize this webinar today to discuss this issue. It is the significant role language may play in the organizational context of international business and management. How can global managers and employees work together effectively in a multinational corporation where their corporate language is different from their own languages? How can a company leverage language policy and strategy as an effective means to improve its performance? So this webinar will focus on the opportunities, challenges involved in working with and managing multiple languages in today's global workplace. We'll listen to an expert on this topic and an executive of a leading language service company to learn how they actually help their clients to deal with some of the challenging organizational issues resulting from language differences. Before we start the program, I'd like to introduce uh, our Dean, Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration at LMU, and ask her to say a few words to greet everyone. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Professor Peck. Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the College of Business and the University, I'm delighted to welcome you all today to today's webinar, exploring the role that language plays on the global business landscape. You know, there's an old joke that goes, if you speak three languages, you're trilingual, two languages, bilingual, and one language, American. I am so envious of so many of my colleagues around the world who are truly multilingual, while here in the States, my own language training did not prepare me for that facility. My own children are doing better. I've got one child bilingual in Spanish and our son, a diplomat and a linguist in the State Department speaks many languages. Although I have to say his language acquisition skills seem to correlate with the native language of each woman he dated. Um, he's now in Oman working on his Arabic for his next post. Nelson Mandela once suggested that if you talk to a person in a language he understands, that goes to his head. But if you talk to him in his language, that goes to his heart. And in my own experience as a business professor and Fulbrighter, I was able to really appreciate those words when living in Hong Kong. Because in preparing for life as an expat, I received a wonderful guide, uh, guide from UK-based HSBC, a global bank with a major stake in Asia. They sent me a brochure with all of the helpful words, particularly in a business context in Cantonese, that I might need to begin acclimating <clears throat> to a new land. My immersive experience living in a Chinese community in the new territories and engaging in the business environment was one of the most transformative moments of my life. And I even still today recall the words, Sukse Mgoi, 
or next stop, please. Critical words in getting around in public transportation. But more importantly, I recall my attempts I made to learn the language and a welcoming culture that appreciated my monotonal attempts at adapting. And some of my most treasured friendships and business relationships are because the relationships started with an attempt to learn a language. So I look forward to hearing from our distinguished guests today. And again, welcome to the webinar. Back to you, Professor Peck. Thank you. Thank you so much for your nice uh, the remarks. Now I'd like to introduce our two speakers and moderator. Our first speaker, Dr. Terence uh, Mugen, who will talk about language general skills. He's a former professor of international management at Anglia Ruskin University in Cambridge, UK. Uh, Dr. Mugen has conducted a number of empirical studies of business internationalization and intercultural competence in companies for a range of policy bodies, such as OECD, UK Trade and Investment, and European Commission. Uh, his work explores the links between foreign language competence, intercultural competence, and international management processes. He is currently leading a group of scholars from Europe and the US in the production of a curriculum for language general competencies for use by universities and companies. Our second speaker, Mr. Jamie Punishow, is a chief marketing officer of Lionbridge, a company that provides translation and localization services. Mr. Punisher is responsible for leading global product development and marketing efforts, including strategy, brand, content, demand generation, digital, and product marketing. Before joining Lionbridge four years ago, he worked as the head of brand strategy and digital marketing at TIAA and global head of content and digital distribution at Thomson Reuters, a multinational media conglomerate based in Canada. And he was also head of the digital innovation at Citibank where he led city, uh, city's industry-leading mobile, social, and next-generation digital efforts. Finally, let me introduce our moderator, who will lead the discussion with these two speakers. Dr. Veronique flambard Weisbart uh, is a professor of French and chair of the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at LNU. Besides teaching beginning to advance French language literature, film courses, she also animates workshops in stylistics and translation and professional French using global and functional simulation pedagogy. Okay, Terry, now the floor is yours. Would you please start your presentation? Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Pack, and thank you, Dr. Smith. It's marvelous to receive and to have as hosts Loyola Marymount University uh, demonstrating that the concept of language and the concept of the United States and particularly the concept of foreign languages are not necessarily foreign to each other, that there is much very good work being done in higher education in American universities to, to promote uh, modern language learning. Um, I used to be a modern language teacher myself. I taught French and German in my early career in, in higher education. And I then moved into uh, the business school through the conduit of cross-cultural management, which is something that uh, in mid-career uh, took a hold of me. Uh, since then, I've come around, back around full circle to concentrate a little bit more on the concept of language. And uh, it's in trying to tie those different experiences together today that I hope to uh, propose to you a model which you feel has some merit in terms of the education process and what happens in organizations and how we need to bring the two of those things more closely together. I'm going to start off talking in a moment about the background, uh, but very, very briefly, I just want to say that the issue of languages is actually something of a hot topic in, in society broadly. Uh, I think that there is um, much discussion about the use of language in terms of uh, creating either warm or hostile environments uh, in terms of actually using language to separate off one group from another in society, um, in creating in-groups and out-groups. Uh, it's not really my intention to address those things, but I just want to be 
within the context that I've just described, as inclusive as I can in saying that uh, whilst my knowledge of foreign language and universities is now quite dated, I may make some suggestions that, that appear out of date and I'm happy to be put right on those things. That's the reason why we're here to exchange knowledge and to find a language that we can all use, which, which I think is inclusive across the entire spectrum. Okay, so very, very briefly, the, my main concern today is to consider how the concept of language has changed. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background and context of my talk, which is about the concept of language general competence. I'll explain language general competence a little bit more, and I hope that, that its meaning kind of emerges as well through the, through the various early phases of the talk. Uh, a negative point. In the English-speaking world, foreign language learning in schools and universities has been in decline for two decades. I was a foreign language teacher when this started happening back in the late 1990s, uh, where all of a sudden uh, recruitment to our French, French language degrees at Anglia Ruskin University fell by 25% overnight for two or three years. Um, nobody really could give us an explanation at the time, but we knew, certainly knew that it was happening. Over the same period, because of technology and migration, in spite of this fall in foreign language learning amongst young people generally, uh, I, I think Jamie might be able to tell us a little bit more later, Jamie Prunish will maybe tell us a little bit more about how the, 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 the sector is, is, is shaping up for mature learners, but certainly young learners of foreign languages in English speaking institutions um, disappeared and, lang and departments disappeared with, with them. While that was happening, language interaction across the globe was increasing exponentially. There were two main, main explanations for that, for that growth, technology and migration. The amount of actual communication taking place through computers, through the IT, social media, um, and Zoom has massively increased, obviously. And the number of people migrating from uh, various developing economies to developed economies also grew rapidly in the first part of, of the millennium. So language interaction, whereby people were bringing languages from one place to another through technological means or through physical means, uh, increased significantly. So plurilingual, plurilingual means people, individuals who speak more than one language, and multilingual and multilateral communication have become the norm. English as a lingua franca only happens because other languages feed it more and more. Uh, that's a really interesting point, and it's borne out by a piece of work by Shahar Ronan, an MIT graduate, um, who studied the use of languages in, in Wikipedia and email. And he found that languages, English languages, certainly at the hub of an entire global communication network, but around it are a sphere, a set of a sphere of set of spheres of what he called intermediate languages, which are those you would expect: Chinese, French, German, Spanish. Um, and Russian, which feed the English language. So there's massive quantities of online translation or translation of various forms, but a lot of online translation taking place that permits data coming from those places and beyond those places from smaller communities, from dialects, permits them to come through into the uh, internet and arrive sometimes in English, uh, having originated in some other different form. It's invisible to us, but it's all happening. So the traditional position is that if you say language in business, most people think Japanese, Russian, Chinese, Spanish, etc. I'm proposing to you that there is more to it than that. There is something that exists between and across national codes. In other words, there are relationships between French and German, between German and Italian, between Italian and Spanish, between Spanish and Russian, that, 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 that linguists know exist. And they condition our reasoning, they condition our cognition, uh, but we sometimes are only semi-conscious at best of, 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 the, of the use that we're making of these different codes of language. So there's been massive growth in this field in international business in the last few years. And it's important for me to state that this is my main concern. I'm coming from the point of view of international business, i.e. organizations which conduct business across national borders and who try to maximize their communication relations understanding of familiarity with the foreign markets 
And uh, this is, was a quiet, this was a quiet, very quiet process in international business up until about 2014. That's when a special issue was published in the Journal of International Business Studies, uh, which de was dedicated to language. It received the second highest level number of, of submissions in the history of JIBS, which was a remarkable achievement. And it completely changed the field of what we call language sensitive research um, since then. So what it revealed is that corporations no longer go out looking for markets and languages. Those languages are on their doorstep and they're actually within their premises as well in many cases. Let me just give you an idea of what I'm talking about here in, in terms that are easily, easily comprehensible to, in statistical terms, they're easily comprehensible to a US context in particular. Um, in the New York metro area, according to the US census of 2017, at least 192 languages other than English are spoken at home. 192 languages are used actively in the home and outside the home in the New York metro area. Within that same area, 38% of the population age five and over speak a language other than English at home. That's 38%, more than a third of the metro area population speak a language other than English at home. Uh, the figures are pretty much proportionate for all other large cities of the United States, and they are truly staggering. Think of the consequences of this in schools, think of the consequences of this in hospitals, think of the consequences of this in the workplace. And if you're an international business buff like me, think about the consequences of it in, in corporations, in business and education management. We are, um, we are growing up at the moment. These people are growing up and will soon be part of the working population. More and more numbers will be part of the working population in the next decade or so. The resource for foreign language competence is much, much greater than it's ever been before. So in the past, in, according to our international business literature, language was, an, was simply an instrument. It was language teaching and translating. They were the two main concepts that were, that were included in the literature up until about 2014. Um, the 21st century has witnessed a new emerging language construct, which is that language is a medium for co complex social relations among language groups on home territory. All languages, not just English, are being used more and more. And in a general sense, language is a key construct in organizational identity and in individual identity within organizations and in business practice. One of the clearest ways in which you can see this at the moment is to see the importance attached to language as a dimension of diversity, equity, and uh, inclusive inclusiveness. Uh, it's becoming a key dimension in the sense that use of terminology, use of forms of language are being critically analysed and are being revised to create a, an atmosphere which is less power oriented, which is less oppressive, which is more open, which is more receptive to different thoughts, different ways of seeing the world. And that can only be a healthy thing in my opinion. So there have been real breakthroughs in understanding a new era of language policy in the international business literature, and I'm sure in, in, in sociolinguistics and psychology, etc. Uh, very importantly, multilinguality, which is the state that we are now in, in most urban areas, in most developed economies in the world, uh, the, the multilinguality is the norm. It may be a hidden norm, but it is the reality that goes on behind the scenes. And there, are, there is much to that in terms of identity and power in organizations and, and understanding how language may facilitate good practices or not so good practices. So individuals can be monolingual. And Dr. Smith, uh, it was a very, very humble thing of you to say that, um, that you feel that you maybe would, would wish that you develop better language skills um, early on in your career. I'm sure we all feel that way too. I mean, certainly the majority of academics I speak to feel that way too, who don't speak foreign languages. Well, individuals can continue to be monolingual. 
but organizations can no longer be. Another important dimension of this conversation is, is going to be addressed by uh, Jamie Punishal in, in, in a few minutes. This is that language is an international business. It's not language as international business or language for international business. Language is an international business. This is a figure from Forbes from a couple of years ago. With the world becoming increasingly connected, the global language services market has seen rapid growth. Over the last 10 years, the market has doubled in size, reaching 49.6 billion US dollars in 2019. This process, as I said, of trans transmission or transfer, transfer of, of, of text meaning from one language to another in its various forms is happening quietly in the background. It certainly isn't happening loudly enough for the international business community to, to have made a big fuss of it, but it's, it's certainly a very, very significant factor. And as I said, that, that will be another issue that will be explored in the course of the next hour or so here. So organizations have become endemically multilingual, even if they don't realize yet that that's happened to them. The main response from many organizations, however, has been to deny or contain this by imposing lingua franca policies or limiting their action to mechanical tactics to deal with language diversity. In spite of, in spite of all of the attempts to champion English as a lingua franca, as, as if that's some kind of victory for, for a football team over another football team, um, is pointless. English is a lingua franca, but it's such a huge market and this is such a huge concept that that lingua franca cannot address all of the issues, all of the challenges, all of the opportunities, all of the possibilities raised by the interaction between all of the languages of the world. And that is actually happening. At the moment, the international business, business textbooks contain nothing about managing language in business. It's, it's frightening. <laughs> so multilinguality needs to be challenged on a linguistic and social, needs to be managed on a linguistic and social level. That is what we call LGC competence, language general competence. And I'm just going to take you through this to give you a sense of what it is, what, how it's different from language specific competence. Language specific competence is proficiency in Chinese, proficiency in a modern, in another modern language. I think what, uh, Veronique will later call L2 or L3. Language general competence is what we define as perceptual and cognitive acuity that spans the boundaries between national languages and cultural contexts. All of these national languages and cultural contexts are now many degrees closer than they were 20 years ago. And they're becoming so close that we need to be able to, we can almost feel them in action when we're in an international meeting, when we're in a when we're in a hospital, hospital waiting room, we feel the language contact, we feel the language friction at times, we feel the language energy. And language general competence is, is an attempt to look at the current environment with a view to understanding this, not just as an as a understanding of a specific code, but of a, an understanding of an interaction process. People with language general competence can sense, intuit, and understand phenomena and subtleties in language use that impact on performance, learning, creativity, strategy implementation, and general well-being in today's complex cultural organizations. So some problems and solutions. How do you choose an official language? That's a language general challenge. What is the impact of this on other language users? That's a language general challenge. So in other words, if German is the official language in the corporation, how do the French people feel about that? And how does that affect relations between French people and German people in the organization? These things are really important matters for the internal functioning of an organization. And we don't yet acknowledge sufficiently how language conditions them. How can gaps and nuances in textual communication be detected and understood? Google Translate is, is maximum 70% reliable, yet it is being used effectively to translate large tranches of text and to, and, and, to, and to present that text as being real English or real next language, real translation. It's not. It's largely flawed. And everybody, and everybody who uses it knows that it's flawed, but nonetheless, machine translation is, is, is running rampant. How can language anxi anxiety be induced by power differentials and how can, how can they be managed in today's multilingual workplace? 
So our LGC project will develop a curriculum for use in management and student education. It will enable all managers to appreciate the dynamics of multiple language use and manage them better. Hopefully this will illustrate how this awareness makes international organizations more efficient and humane. And by articulating the strategic role of language, we believe this will help promote language learning on all levels. So language general competence in, in my view is in no way a threat to foreign language, modern language learning. It is an attempt to enhance modern language learning and enhance the skills of people who learn modern languages. Very importantly, however, I think it's important to say, and here again, maybe Jamie has, a, has, a com has an observation for us. Very importantly, understanding how languages are managed um, is, not is not confined to practicing linguists. It's not confined to accomplished linguists. We need to develop a curriculum which makes that possible, makes those skills accessible to people who are not uh, proficient linguists. And I think that Jamie as I said, may, may, may have something to say there. So thanks very much for listening. Uh, if you want to know more, um, if you want me to send you a bibliography or an article related to this presentation, or if you want to receive a copy of a PDF of the translation itself, you can drop a line to Terry Mugan, T-E-R-R-Y-M-U-G-H-A-N at me, M-E dot com. And I think that you'll probably be getting that, uh, that invitation in the email too. So thank you very much indeed. Okay, we're getting, uh, Jamie. Jamie. All right. If only I could find the uh, mute button, then everything would work much better. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, and uh, Tara, I think you just um, teed up about 87 questions um, that I'm uh, responsible for. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think maybe it probably makes sense to, uh, to hit some of those in the Q&A. Um, I, I did. I put together just a couple of slides because I think they're they're instructive guideposts for um, what's going on in the business world um, and, and amongst organizations. Uh, and, and, and how we are, are, you know, what we're observing and, and, and reframing the, the conversation with a lot of organizations. But, but I, I thought it might be helpful just to, to tell me a little bit about Lionbridge and, and um, a few things about me just to, to tee this up. Um, I am Jamie Conishal. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Lionbridge. Um, uh, much um, like some of the earlier comments, I wish I had much more proficient language skills. Um, it will probably not... Um, strike anybody is more ironic than it does to me that uh, um, I don't speak another language other than English. Um, I've got uh, one year of German and one year of uh, Russian um, and a few years of high school Spanish um, to at least be able to read a few things, but I, but I don't proficiently speak um, another language, but I do work for a language company who specializes in this. Um, and, and I think that actually helps ca capture the you know, the, the, the nuance in, in the way this world is evolving, which is, you know, global business isn't just about language. Um, it is about, you know, globality. It is about, um, you know, cultural adaptation, melding. Um, and, you know, somebody like me, in fact, I'm very few of the executives on the, the Lionbridge um, team. Um, most of us are Americans and most of us don't speak um, other language other than uh, English, but we are global citizens. Uh, almost all of us have worked for global companies. Um, we are all more cosmopolitan in our, in our worldview and how we operate. Um, we all travel extensively for business and otherwise. And, and you can see the, the difference in, in this team and in others that I've, I've worked with before. For those of you who don't know Lionbridge, um, we were, we're actually just celebrating our 25th year. You can see all the pretty graphics behind me. My team just launched our 25th anniversary. Um, and, you know, if you think about quickly the history of, of business, translation, as some will joke, is the second oldest profession um, and, and it was really about text. Um, and really until the early 1980s, that is, you know, primarily um, what this business was, was a translation of text. Uh, and uh, many of the largest translation agencies were actually owned by large publishing houses, not um, uh, surprisingly. 
but with the dawn of the PC age, um, a new concept was introduced, which is localization. Um, and that is the beginning of adapting not only the text, um, uh, but the experience, software, um, mobile applications, uh, you know, video, um, movies, um, into the cultural environment um, that the, um, the recipient, the reader, the, the experiencer of the, um, of the application or of the multimedia asset is, is having. Um, so this has visual dimensionality, it has textual dimensionality, sometimes it has experiential dimensionality. Um, and you've probably never really thought about it, but you know, if accidentally one night, um, you're not really watching what you're doing and you're in your settings on your iPhone or your um, uh, Google phone, and suddenly you find it working in another language and you ever wonder to yourself, who did this and how does it happen? It, the answer is companies like ours. Um, and, you know, this can be quite complicated. You've got left to right languages and right, to, uh, you know, right to left languages. You've got imagery differentials. Um, you've got business practices. You've got currencies. Um, and that's really where the localization industry came from. In fact, our name quite literally is, is born of this. Shorthand for localization is L10N. There are 10 letters between L and N. Um, and if you write it out, L10N, it looks like the word lion. And so we were localization, your bridge to the, um, to the world. Um, and in short, you know, shorthand, that became Lion Bridge. Um, if you, I will argue, and nobody has fought me on this for the four years I've been at Lion Bridge. So let's take it as fact until somebody disproves me otherwise, that if, if McDonald's is really one of the first companies in the world to understand that you could export an experience restaurant to restaurant, town to town, state to state, and ultimately country to country. For a very long time, a way to get a little taste of America was to eat at a McDonald's somewhere else. And as an American traveling, I remember very, you know, quite vividly my very first trip abroad, it was to Belgium. Um, and after being there for two weeks and eating food that I had never um, really experienced before, that first bite into a Big Mac was a little taste of home. Um, I'm not, you know, the biggest fan of McDonald's food, but it did taste like home. And, and they really were understood that you could extend an experience and a feeling um, across the globe in new ways. I will argue that Microsoft is the first company to, to really look at the world and at the time anyway, all 3 billion of its inhabitants, now obviously closer to 8 billion, and say, every time we develop a product and service, our total addressable market is 8 billion people or 3 billion back when, when Microsoft was really getting uh, very international in the early 1990s. Um, and that's a very different mindset. There are probably, um, uh, there's no scientific analysis of this, but just my gut feel is there are roughly 25, maybe 50 organizations in the world that truly operate globally where their mindset every day as they develop products and services and customer experiences is this is going to go to everybody on the planet. And it's quite different um, in the way you build your products and services, even the way you write software, the way you code um, is substantially different when your ultimate end goal is that it will be a multilingual, multicultural or omnilingual experience. And, and I'll give you a very simple example of this um, from the financial world. If you build a system to be a single currency application and then try to make it multi-currency, you will discover it is a very expensive and very difficult enterprise. Um, you have to build with multi-currency in mind almost from the get-go, global from the get-go. You want to be global ready from the get-go. And th this is really the... the, the transformation that's going on in, in the business world, not just in America, but in many, many countries um, where they are having to think about how they design products and services for a global audience right out the gate. Um, and as, you know, turn to notice, it, this is very difficult. You know, India alone has, you know, 22, um, uh, you know, official languages, 122 that are most commonly spoken, um, uh, you know, and how do you develop a movie? How do you compete with Netflix as you're developing um, a, um, a, a video asset, a television show, who automatically um, uh, translates or provides voiceover or subtitling or captioning for every piece of content that they deploy um, into, um, into, the, into, into India? 
Um, and that, that creates some really interesting new challenges. Let me just share a couple slides here that I think frame this up and, and then uh, you know, love to move forward and really open it up for questions because I think this will be more interesting for everybody because uh, there's so many different places that we could, we could go with this. Um, but let me share this. So hopefully, yes, you can um, hopefully see this screen. There are really four big um, uh, phenomenon that we are watching large organizations deal with right now. In many ways, really accelerated by the pandemic and the adjustments that the global economy has had to make um, to the last 18, 24, 24 months. Obviously all of us have made big adjustments individually, um, but it has radically altered the way we are working and the way goods are being bought and sold. Um, and, and I'll argue there are really you know, four key things that are going on. Um, that you can't talk about um, uh, what companies are working on without talk, hearing about customer experience. Um, and customer experience, interestingly enough, if you dive deep into the research, um, is actually best measured on emotional dimensions. It's really how people feel about the experience. This is why every Apple product is designed so deftly for the touch, the packaging, um, the quality of the materials are designed to convey an emotional set to you. Whether you are an Apple fanboy um, or you are a hater, um, and it usually is one of those two things um, of the Apple universe, um, everything they do is designed to craft a certain emotional set. And, and good customer experience really is. Let's call them famous for its customer experience. It's an emotional um, reaction to a brand. Well, there is nothing more personal than language and culture to, um, uh, to, to most of us. And yet, um, and you know, you've heard it referred to in a number of places, the vast majority uh, of products, particularly those that are built in this country that are then exported, are not designed for any other market but this one. Um, we build them first here and then we try to adapt them. And that leaves a very different emotional footprint um, or fingerprint or paw print in our case um, uh, uh, in, in how the consumer is receiving that, those goods or those services. And as you hear more and more businesses talk about personalization um, and trying to speak one-to-one -on, one -one or very uniquely to any given persona or archetype or segment or group, um, how can they do that? without really excellent um, uh, approach to language and cultural adaptation um, and, and language services. Um, digital transformation, um, interestingly enough for me, as a person who's been leading digital transformation since the mid nineties, when I was um, you know, 25 and knew what the interwebs were and that made me an expert, um, clearly the last 20 months has convinced everybody to the extent that they weren't already, that digital is gonna be a very big thing and is really forcing a real top to bottom rethink on the supply chain and the experience chain of organizations. And what's interesting that people are not yet realizing and talking about is the digital universe, the world that we're in right now, this two dimensional or this, this, um, this webinar, it's 2D, right? It isn't 3D, it isn't rooted in geography. It isn't rooted in physicality. Um, and we just went through what I like to call the world's greatest A-B test because we took geography and we took physicality out and said, what would the world look like if we just all operated through this electronic browser? And in that world where it is two-dimensional, we discovered that all kinds of language and cultural issues have been hidden behind our human browsers, our local stores, or our um, local employees, um, but that we fail on the digital transformation front. Um, and as a really good example of this, um, something like 10% of, um, uh, sorry, 90% of all the content available on the internet is in English. I'll just let that sit in for, settle in for a second. 90% of all the content available on the internet is in English. I don't have to tell you that the vast majority of this population, English is not their first language, much less something they would consider consider themselves proficient in, even more importantly, something they would make really critical decisions on. And this is now, I'll move to the, to the fourth uh, box over here. This is also now happening in the workforce. Um, you know, like many organizations, ours has gone entirely virtual. Um, we will likely never return to the previous geographically based model that we had. Um, we will be a virtual first um, hybrid organization. That's 6,000 Lionbridge employees or Lions as we call them around the globe 
the vast majority of whom will not go into an office again on any kind of a regular basis, maybe not even at all. And so now in that new workforce experience where again, the computer and you know, Teams and Zoom and Slack um, and all the other collaboration platforms are now the prime interface. Do they work in a multilingual, omnilingual, multicultural, omnicultural universe? And the reality is our workforce experience is quite often we're geographically located. We let local offices drive local language decisions, et cetera, or we force lingua franca-like um, experiences on folks. And that just starts to break down in the digital workforce, the remote workforce um, universe. Workforce experience is probably six, seven, eight years behind um, the, the push in customer experience. Uh, it's been happening in, um, in, in the corporate universe, but it is coming on hot and heavy. Um, and this will become a real challenge for organizations and how they manage the global workforce um, and, and content um, and experiences. One way to visualize this um, that I find useful, I'm a big fan of um, Edward Tufte. If, you're not a, if you don't know Tufte, it's worth um, uh, looking him up. He's an expert in the art of visual design and um, uh, uh, in presentation of data and, and visualizations. And this is actually, I lifted um, uh, uh, one of his, one of the more famous examples that he uses, which is actually from um, a French uh, philosopher, former military, um, uh, former general, that um, uh, was describing Napoleon's march on Moscow, which as for those of you who know your history, didn't go so well for Napoleon. He left Paris with 400,000 soldiers and um, on the left-hand side of the screen, goes to Moscow, um, you know, you can see by the light gray line there, he lands with, you know, 100,000 soldiers. And by the time he gets back, he has 10,000. And this graphic is quite famous for showing all the battles and weather and loss of soldiers, et cetera. But quite frankly, this is a perfect representation of what's going on in global commerce. Because if you start with 90% of all the website in, in English, but your buyers aren't very confident in English. In fact, many won't even visit an English, uh, visit, uh, 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 sorry, that should say won't visit English sites or non-source sites, right? Most prefer their native content, product uh, language to buy content. Um, you can see they abandon their cards. Um, many won't repeat buy, um, even though if they bought originally in a language that wasn't their own, they won't repeat buy. And you can see this comes in real practical terms on the back end of it. 50% uh, lower SEO performance. I'll show you some real examples of this in just a second. A lot less web traffic, lower um, click-through rates, uh, more expensive work in campaign development, um, higher costs to push out, and going back to the CX, just 4% of your content on brand. So this is an array of stats that basically show what happens when companies start with source language and or host language and host um, uh, uh, source country experiences, and then either don't or poorly adapt them to a whole variety of markets. Um, and really what it amounts to is, you know, uh, lost sales, fewer renewals, less speed, higher costs, and undermining brand. And, let, you know, we know almost all companies are really focused on their brand. Here are just a few more stats just to frame this up. Um, just to put it in perspective, the leading companies, those 25, 30 that I talked about, um, are localizing in about 30 languages. Um, for those of you who don't know, there are roughly 7,000 languages in the world, plus or minus. Obviously, the vast majority of us speak uh, one of the 12 major languages, um, and many of those languages that are in the 7,000 are spoken only. There is no written form. Um, but in this global universe, we have all kinds of interesting opportunities and all kinds of sub-markets to go after. Um, and while those number of languages has doubled, we're still only at 30, which leaves us with um, uh, quite a bit of way to go. Um, again, with 122, just representing um, uh, India. Um, you can see that turnaround times and, and the speed with which people want to push content out and then get it into all those languages is increasing, which is going to drive the use of more of the machine translation um, that, that, that uh, Terrence talked about. Um, and while the public you know, domain access, accessible um, tools like the Google Translates or Microsoft Translate or what have you, which you can use for free. Um, they, they don't, we all have our funny stories about what happens when we stick content in there. 
um, in, in, in the practical world of professional translation, this is actually going to be the key lever that allows us to really break the back of the barrier that is language and culture, because we can achieve scale and speed we've never been able to before using the machine translation as the starting point and then using professional translators and linguists to take us um, to, the, uh, to the next level. Let me just, uh, let me finish there um, by just showing um, one very practical thing. Um, uh, you know, as a marketer, I, you know, I wear two hats. I'm CMO for Lionbridge, where I talk about what we do for customers, et cetera. And I'm also obviously driving the marketing of my own organization. Um, and here's a very tangible example of what happens when you do these kinds of things well. This is a presentation I made to our board of directors recently um, to show how we compare against a lot of our, um, uh, uh, the, the industry competitors market by market. Um, and this just shows you how few companies do a really good job at this. And when you focus on it, how you can have outsized business results. Um, and just so you can read these charts, the y-axis uh, for all of these is the average position in um, Google search. Um, and the x-axis is the number of terms that you rank on. So the big orange blobs are us and you want to have higher average position and you want to rank on more keywords. And what this practically means is I'm getting a lot of free marketing. That is a lot of people are finding us in the discoverable universe um, and discoverability is everything in today's modern business, modern marketing world. Um, and they can do that in their native language and find our goods and services, which is the key to un unlocking these very large scale global platforms and global economies. So with that, um, let me uh, pause on the, uh, my sort of official um, uh, comments and um, stop there, pass it along, and then uh, I'm here to ask some questions, answer some questions rather. I can ask them too, but nobody wants to hear my questions. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for these two presentations, uh, Terence and uh, uh, Jamie. And um, I wanted also to uh, thank uh, the, the Dr. Smith for the remark that she had in the beginning about uh, if you touch the reason uh, um, you, uh, with a foreign language, it's one thing, uh, or I'll go back to, to the question of foreign, uh, but uh, if you touch their heart, this is uh, how you're going to, uh, make it happen. So uh, the first thing uh, uh, I wanted to um, address has to do with, uh, um, and Ter Ter Terence, you address this question, uh, the word foreign uh, in our presentation, uh, which uh, is not a term that uh, is um, uh, preferred uh, these days because uh, it uh, uh, focuses, it's very hegemonic and it's like focusing on language one or L1 as I'll call them. And uh, um, so making it like the, the state of reference. Um, so I, I just would like to give a brief introduction um, uh, to uh, the use of uh, uh, languages uh, or learn the, the education around languages. So as you mentioned, uh, there was a lingua franca before the 1970s. Uh, uh, lingua franca approach, which meant that you had the language one and language two as two uh, entities. And what you were trying to do, you were translating mostly language one to language two, and then language two to language one. And that the, the whole point of this was more of a, um, it, it was more of a written approach, not so much, um, uh, communicative approach, which changed uh, starting in 1970s when uh, suddenly uh, communication uh, became the main point of languages uh, learning. And um, uh, that happened, uh, what, how it changed the, the role of language, uh, it was that language too uh, was becoming the, um, I mean, you, you had to become um, proficient enough in a language too, so that you could uh, improvise, uh, that, so that you could uh, use that language uh, and be able to improvise with that language. 
Uh, and so um, the focus from the 1970s all the way to now, it's still that, uh, is that you have language two as the main uh, focus in the language uh, class, um, uh, meaning that um, uh, the language one, which happens to be English uh, in, uh, in America, uh, is not uh, accepted uh, in the class. So you, you want to have, the, with the communicative approach, uh, you, um, you are putting language one aside and you're functioning with language two. Mm. Uh, because uh, the, uh, the logic around this is that uh, the language one would be um, sort of stopping uh, your progress in language two, if if it if they in, um, interact or interfere. Mm. So um, uh, I would like to uh, bring um, something that's been happening uh, lately uh, in this uh, around this conception of uh, language two being uh, the only uh, language that you you should be uh, using uh, in the, mm. in a language classroom, and that would be. Um, this uh, theory of uh, translanguaging, um, which uh, challenges the dominant uh, monolingual approach, uh, which views L1 as a source of interference uh, to second language uh, acquisition or learning. And uh, it takes advantage uh, of uh, students uh, L1 uh, knowledge, so let's say in America, their English, their knowledge in English, to maximize the growth of students by combining L1 and uh, L2 uh, languages. So um, what changes is that uh, suddenly it's not L1 versus L2 as two entities, but it's sort of a hybrid, um, mm -hmm. I'm generalizing, but sort of a hybrid um, uh, approach uh, where um, L1 and L2 are playing with each other and, uh, and uh, um, um, helping us to better achieve uh, the, uh, um, uh, this uh, um, interaction uh, uh, between the languages. So it changes from L1, L2 before the 70s, then uh, to L2, and then now uh, with this uh, translanguaging and this new approach that is controversial among uh, uh, linguists, um, this uh, sort of uh, hybrid mode between uh, um, L1 and L2 uh, interacting. Uh, so that's a very general uh, um, presentation of the, 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 uh, the evolution of uh, language. Um, I wanted to um, uh, also, uh, so this is what we have at this point, and I would like to have your take uh, on this. What uh, do you feel, uh, Terence and Jamie, this, this, uh, um, th this question uh, comes to you. Uh, Jamie, uh, you mentioned uh, 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 McDonald's as a um, MNC. And um, uh, you said something about um, uh, uh, how you felt at home uh, when, uh, when you ate your burger in Belgium. Uh, what I want, I mean, it made me think right away of uh, um, the uh, Tarantino film, uh, uh, Pulp Fiction, where he's uh, saying that the French um, in uh, the... <laughs> In, in, Paris, in France, that they um, called it the, the quarter pounder, uh, they called it uh, Le Royal, uh, the, the, the king's uh, uh, <laughs> burger. And um, I mean, what you were talking about, about this um, uh, inter, I mean, how, what makes you feel at home? It's not obviously there would have been a perfect example that it is not. Uh, the uh, the perfect mm -hmm. translation that will make it work. I mean, if you tell the French that uh, uh, if you translate a quarter pounder, well, first of all, uh, the French uh, and 
many other places in the world, use the uh, uh, grams or kilograms. So first of all, you could have just translated that into uh, the um, grams, you know, and say, okay, uh, French people, here is how we are uh, advertising or marketing our product. We are saying it's like a, a quarter pounder uh, uh, in grams, but that's not how they, it happened because that, if you give the French like 100 gram uh, burger, I don't think this is what's gonna attract them. There's this sort of um, uh, cultural <laughs> um, a thing about le royal. So the, the king's um, burger that sort of changed the whole thing. And that's what attracted, that was the, a very clever marketing uh, uh, approach. That was not, um, so, in relation to what um, you are um, uh, saying about um, how the the culture uh, part and, and and with all the search engines and the translation uh, uh, tools that we have today, this is not. And as Terry was saying, seventy percent of Google translations are appropriate. Huh? So how how. Um, uh, do you see um, uh, this cultural uh, bridge? That is also in some ways what uh, the translanguaging is uh, trying to achieve, this uh, sort of a, a trans uh, uh, cultural, I mean, and, and uh, uh, interaction between the, the culture it's through language, but beyond language. Language as a way to um, translate culture um, and uh, so that, that is basically my <laughs> general um, questions on that. How, what is your take on, on this? <clears throat> Boy, we, and we could spend an entire afternoon um, talk, talking about that. And you know, and you hear there's lots of mostly apocryphal stories, right? Of bad translations, mm -hmm. you know, like the Chevy Nova. Um, that didn't actually happen. Um, it sounds great, but it didn't. You know, that is, Chevy didn't really try to take the Nova into, you know, uh, the Spanish speaking countries and say, oh, I didn't know that that meant no go for those of you who don't speak Spanish. Um, it's a great story, but it didn't happen. Um, but Coke did, as a good example, when they first translated um, Coca Cola into Chinese, um, uh, because, you know, the Chinese is such a phonetic language. Um, trying to find the right characters that get you Coca-Cola. You know, the early translations were, there's a few of them that you hear, but bite the wax tadpole is, is a, you know, one of the common mistranslations, but they knew that. They, and so they worked to find exactly the right characters so that it still sounded something like Coca-Cola to, in China, um, because there's an interesting thing. Are you translating the name or the name feel? Um, and, you know, there it was really the feel, the, the, the phoneticness of the name. I mean, this has so much dimensionality to it. It is, you know, simple things. Um, you have a product, you put um, a picture of a woman in your marketing materials and then take it to, um, you know, some Arabic speaking countries. How that woman looks is very, very different, can look in order to be culturally acceptable. And, and this just plays itself out. So I, I think at the heart of your question, Veronique, is, is an important one, which is, this isn't just about the translation, um, right? Sometimes it just is, but more often than not, it isn't. And that really takes me back to the heart of what I was talking about, which is if you accept that, what I'm trying to achieve is that this person feels as good and as connected to my brand or my, my organization, I want them to feel the same way in every country. How am I going to create that feeling set that one, I have to change the way I create things from the very get-go. I'll give you an easy example of that in half a second. Um, but then I have to really think at a much higher level. This isn't a translation exercise. This is a cultural adaptation exercise. Um, and that is visual, um, that is experiential, um, it is smell, it is, and, and things are different. Every, every country has a different recipe for Coke because we all have different tastes, right? Mexico, Coke in Mexico, much sweeter. Coke in Europe, much sweeter than it is in America. 
because the American palate would never accept it. Same core product, um, but I can tell the difference when I travel country to country. I don't drink a lot of Coca Cola anymore, but certainly as a kid, I you know as a young adult, I could I could I could feel that. But some of that really requires a resetting of how you operate. So we just worked with a um, major international cruise line as a good example, whose tagline up until recent. Um, uh, doesn't tr wouldn't translate very well into um, any uh, into Japan, into China, into Korea, and where they really saw a lot of expansion in Asia Pacific. Um, and so they could have done a lot of work, created a sub brand or a, a slightly different adaptation, or if they, they could do what they did, which more and more organizations are doing, which is okay, can we find a brand? Um, not just tagline, but a whole brand mission and a brand identity that lives more on universal humanity and universal values. So mm -hmm. as I adapt it culture to culture, region to region, it adapts very nicely. Um, and it's, it's really the fit and finish at the end. It isn't, um, it isn't you know, a major remodel or something totally, um, totally different. And that gets you out of something like the exa exact example you just gave. So what I would have said to McDonald's if they thought that they were going to sell their burger potentially in every country, you don't, you wouldn't choose quarter pounder. It's a bad choice out the right out the gate because it won't translate into metrics. It won't translate into many cultures. You have to find something that's more universal. And nobody does this better than Apple, by the way. Right? Apple actually does not do a lot of adaptation um, in their marketing. But if you look at their marketing, it's very abstract, right? It's colors, it's images it, it, or shapes of people. And that's on purpose. That's so we don't get, you know, male female dynamics. We don't get identity dynamics. You don't get cultural reactive dy dynamics. They are you, they're universal to humanity, which for them actually means that their marketing efforts are much easier. They have a global audience right out the gate. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and Terence, do you have uh, any uh, uh, comments on the L1, L2 uh, uh, relationship? I mean, that you would like to. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. You, you took me back a few years to a time where that was my main preoccupation uh, in terms of how we deliver value to students and how we interact with students as, 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 as teachers, and as instructors, professors, whatever. Um, what, what does strike me is that what you described as the translanguaging model, and, I, and I've come across this, I mean, and this, and, uh, this takes me back to what I was trying to make, the points I was trying to make in my presentation, which is, is, is the, it's the coexistence of languages in a community, which has effectively changed in the last 20 years. And the people that, the people that we're teaching now, it seems to me, have a language which is essentially, have a background which is essentially plurilingual from the get-go. Um, that they, you know, that they're, they're, they're people who live in communities where uh, there, there is intermarriage and you get, you get grandparents speaking different languages in the community, even if, if, even if it were, say, an Indian uh, immigrant community, that you get people coming into the community who speak different dialects and different languages. So the people in the, in the room now uh, do not have as rigid an L1 as you were describing. Uh, and as I experienced earlier in my career, that their L1 is effectively a form of plurilingualism from the, from the get-go. Their mindset is more flexible linguistically. It's more flex flexible in terms of sound, more flexible in terms of the productive skills. They, they, they're, encouraged to, they're encouraged to speak foreign languages before thinking about whether they can get the whether they're pronouncing the word properly or not you know I mean that's part of their, their mindset by the time they get into the classroom in many many cases so I think it's a very valuable model I think it's a model which is in tune with where the where society is is societies are going developed societies are going and I think that yes there is a lot of there is a lot of the other dimension the language general competence dimension within that model which which is uh, which I think is important. I lived by the grammar when I was learning a foreign language when I was younger. The, the grammar book was my Bible. And nobody really cared whether I was communicating effectively with a native speaker of that language. If I was, if I was using correct grammar, I was getting top grades. Mm -hmm. yes. And 
you know, we're in a much, much more versatile and much, we have to be much, much more uh, ambidextrous in, 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 in contemporary life using telephone while talking to somebody and all of these things. I think that Jamie's model of, Jamie's, Jamie's model of, of language and marketing, if I can put it that way, of integrating language into the, not just the essentials of the, the business that he's in, but into the essentials of the marketing adaptation process and the product development process is really valuable. I wish I'd had that a year ago when I was teaching international management, because as I said, this kind of perception of language as a structural element in a curriculum, in a strategy, in a, in a syllabus, whatever, language as a structural element is, is unfortunately largely missing. So I, I think there have been two really, really great observations there about how professionals are adapting concepts of language and models of language and integrating them into frameworks, frameworks to make those frameworks inherently more effective from a professional and from a business point of view. So thank you very much. Absolutely thank excellent. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions from uh, the audience. Um, uh, one uh, attendee is asking, how can you really learn a language in a short time to be prepared to en engage in business? Does it, doesn't it require many years of study and immersion? Um, I can come on that very briefly and maybe Jamie could come from a more business, from a more business point of view. Yeah, I mean, learning a language for business, I mean, the, most companies, see language needs the way they see all other needs they see them in terms of their corporate strategy they see them in terms of the corporate aspirations what they want what the, what the organization wants to achieve and they decide where they need to slot people to complete particular tasks and where they need to have skills in teams a, a bridge between to some extent what jamie was saying and what, what i've been talking about is the concept of the multicultural team uh, nobody talks about the multilingual team but people talk about the multicultural team and the language dimensions of the multi multilingual team are left to, left to chance. In other words, you can have a multicultural team that's full of Romance language speakers, but they're multicultural because they're Spanish, Italian, etc. Um, the, the the multicultural team is the intermediate level of analysis, which which where you see the real fusion of all of these skills, competences, business processes. And you can use the multicultural team as a vector for, 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 for achieving strategic things. I think Jamie, Jamie made it clear in his presentation that it's the internal dimension of what you do with a piece of data or with a piece of, with a business idea. It's the, it's the internal process of how you improve on it that really matters. And we need to get organizations into the stage where they don't necessarily just look for somebody who is tip top fluent in Chinese. They may look for somebody who has medium level Chinese, but who's got great capacity, who's got a great understanding of some aspect of IT. And they're putting those two bits of the jigsaw together in random ways. So any form of language learning and acquisition is valuable. You shouldn't let the, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be put off by the idea that you need to be 100% fluent, like a native speaker mm -hmm. bef before you start actually learning the language. Learn it, keep on learning it. It's a lifelong thing. And at a certain point, you'll be in one of those midpoint grades at the very least where an organization sees those skills plus other skills that you have as being perfect for what they want to achieve at a given moment in time. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give you another uh, question. Um, how can you really learn a language in a short time to be prepared to engage in business? Doesn't it require many years of study and immersion? And uh, um, a, a, a related question, uh, learn a language in business. Um, if you want to learn uh, Chinese in business, um, how uh, we uh, better find the book for business Chinese so to learn to communicate in a short time. I mean, so uh, the, the element of uh, how fast <laughs> <laughs> can you get uh, to um, to a level? I mean, uh, is there in a short time? Uh, uh, well, I mean, diplomatic services, the governments, governments all over the world have been doing this for many, many years. And it's a question of resources. If you, if, if you want to go and work in the 
diplomatic service for the US or for the CIA or for MI5 or any 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 leading government if you've got the raw material that they want they'll get you the language skills because they'll simply they'll they'll bathe you in the language so they'll immerse you in the in those language in that language training and skills um that's very very expensive uh and so really any form of learning which 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 where there is a concurrent exposure to the everyday use of that language is going to be more valuable than when you're sitting in a language laboratory trying to learn it on your own in a place where nobody else is speaking it so you have to create the right balance of of contingencies to get the best form to get the best kind of learning which and is if, a perfect uh, ending to um to uh, the discussion because uh, um someone uh, was suggesting that uh, you should go and study abroad mm. <laughs> as a as a main uh, way of um, achieving absolutely this. yeah it's it's, <laughs> it's by far the most effective thing and if you can get a work placement while you're abroad as well mm -hmm. that makes it even better Turn. i did i did study abroad um and every time i would try to use my very basic french um everybody would drop in to practice their english and yes. i ended up not learning <laughs> nearly as much french as i wanted yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. everybody was so happy to practice uh, practice their english I, if i could just add just before we close up I think so much of this is mindset um, and as opposed to worrying about proficiency, um, uh, you know, and again, as a person, who do, I do not speak any other language fluently, um, but I go every place I go, I, I try to learn at least a little bit. I make my efforts. That alone is the beginning of a very different kind of engagement, whether it's with the taxi driver or the Uber driver um or it is in the business context and and i think you know it's 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 all of the the respect um and sort of the acknowledgement of the culture and the difference um and the appreciation if they're speaking english and, and you hear this all the time i hear from my colleagues they'll always apologize for their english and I have to remind them that their english is infinitely better than whatever my version of their language is um, and, and, well, if you have an accent in a language, it means that you speak another language. And, and yeah, and you're trying. And, and so I, I think it's, I go back to, you can see this in the organizations, and, and I think you see it in the people that are very successful as global business leaders. It starts from an appreciation of the vast differences um, and trying to learn about those things and, and begin to build those bridges. And that actually matters infinitely more than the actual language proficiency. I'm not trying to say you shouldn't try to become proficient in, in the language um, before I start to get nasty emails uh, by a stretch of the imagination. But I, I do think there's a big mindset that can really help. Do we have time for another question? Um, uh... Unfortunately, Veronique, I think that uh, we have to wrap up the webinar. So, uh, thank you so much uh, for moderating uh, the panel session. Oh, thank you. Mary and Jamie. Thank you so much for illuminating a new perspective about language. Um, obviously, we need more time, but I was going to ask last question, but I think that Jamie, you answered. We have many students attending this webinar today, and the most important skills, um, as you suggested, is to try to understand that other people, I think that so-called the global local uh, integration mm -hmm. It begins with uh, self-awareness and self-identification and learning about the other people and try to learn how to bridge these differences, as you mentioned. So once again, Terry, Jamie, and Veronique, I, I can't thank you enough uh, for sharing your experiences and insights uh, with us about this timely and important topic. We also like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. Uh, we'll be back with another interesting program on global talent management on November 16th uh, during the International Education Week. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. I really appreciate if you can complete a brief survey at the end of this webinar. Once again, thank you so much, everyone, and see you in November. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.